Welcome to Offsiders. Just one week out from the FIFA World Cup and the Socceroos have had a confidence-boosting win in their final international friendly. The 2-1 defeat of Hungary exposed some defensive flaws in the Australian outfit, which will be devastating if repeated in that first group game against France next Saturday. But an exciting teenage substitute, this World Cup's youngest player, provided a glimpse of what might be possible in Russia. Arzani on the left. Here is Daniel Arzani. He's going to go. Oh, it's got in. It's got through the goalkeeper. And Daniel Arzani, welcome to international football. An inspired change, as it turns out, by Bert van Marwijk. And Daniel Arzani, the youngster who's been the name on everyone's lips this A-League season, gets his first international goal just a minute or so after coming off the bench. Nice start for the youngster and joining us on today's program is Richard Hines, Alistair Nicholson and former Matilda Melissa Barbieri. And Melissa, no pressure on the youngster, but if he could do that again next week, that would be good. <laughs> it would be lovely, but um, the kid has come on leaps and bounds since being at Melbourne City and it's just great to see him. He's not overly exuberant or anything like that because he knows it's a goalkeeper error. Yeah. So he doesn't go, you know, crazy and, and his teammates are more happy than he is, but it just shows how humble the kid is and it's not letting it, he's not letting it get to his head just yet. Um, but when it comes down to it, it is a World Cup coming up and you forgive him for being nervous, but he's not. He's really taking it. And, and it was a real lacklustre game. Like that ball through to Jackson Irvin just to get that final goal was amazing. So like that vision, and, and that's beyond his years. Like he's, he's a young player, but he's just doing things that will get him more game time at the World Cup. And that's a big difference. And Richard, um, what do you make of the, the teenager coming on on the 74th minute? Before that, um, you yeah. know, not a lot to love about... Really exciting ball. and really telling that we've got the youngest player and the oldest player at the World Cup in Azani and Tim Kale. Really telling, I thought, that Azani got first crack, not Kale. I think that's a really great thing for Australian football. But Melissa... To me, there was a lot of mistakes at the back, and I, I just kind of watched that game and tremble a little bit. You know, next next time they play, those mistakes will be made, and it'll be Giroud and Griezmann, and these. <laughs> sort of, that's just the G's might, yeah, <laughs> that these, exactly. these French stars will be going through them. What did you make of the, the way they defended at the back? Because that's been the whole emphasis of this squad going into the into this World Cup. So for me, it's it's a matter of viewing it as they're going into a World Cup. They've been preparing really, really hard. So it's been a tough sort of pre-season for them. Van Marwijk has really been taking it to them in the training area. And so they're a bit tired. They're making really tired mistakes. Like the um, Mark Milligan mistake was made in with him in, in possession of the ball. So it's not exactly a defensive mistake, but still something that will be capitalised with France. Hungary was sitting back and allowing the, the Socceroos to come out. Um, the other one was Josh Risden. I think there's a little bit of complacency working the, its way into the team. And so the benefit of winning this game, but also playing poorly, will play into the hands of Van Marwijk. He will say to them, look, you got the win, but really you've made some really poor mistakes. Josh Risden has come out of nowhere to, to cement his spot at that right back. And as soon as a coach says... Mate, we're OK with our right back now. All, all that needs is a little bit of complacency into Josh Risden and he gets caught out a couple of times. So now it'll, it'll make him think and sew that up mm. um, for the next game against France. And the coach did say, Al, that he, he wasn't satisfied with the performance, but he did like that the team wanted to win. You know, and that's so important. The score wouldn't have mattered. Sometimes all. you have to win ugly, don't you? And that's what the Socceroos were able to do. So they've won, <clears throat> excuse me, two games now, leading into a World Cup. So it's interesting. Positional changes. I think there could be a few potentially. Melissa Mila Yedinak came on in the second half into the midfield, and the midfield a little dysfunctional in the first half last night. Uh, could he go into the backs and replace? say, Mark Milligan and partner Trent Sainsbury, perhaps? For me personally, I would like to see Yedinak playing. I just want to see him on the pitch. He, he's been our captain for a while now. Um, so I think he has the, the composure that a midfielder could bring if he would slot into the back line and he, if he has the defensive cap capabilities, I think he would be a good slot in at the centre-back. Uh, for Milligan, if Milligan starts to play up a bit in, in that position, but... 
uh, you want Millet on the ground. Um, he has that composure and that dominance and that physicality that I really think the Socceroos could do with. Yeah. This might sound a little bit defeatist, but the lead-up to the World Cup, this reminds me a little bit of 2012 because we had Germany first up there and everyone knows what happened. They, we lost 4-0 and mm -hmm. it was pretty much over before it started. We are going up against France straight off. I guess it's, you know, there are those defensive weaknesses, but this time we know about them. I think we were coming, in 2008, we were coming it's off the back. Yeah, and I think there was that ebullience of we got through in 2008. We still had the remnants of the golden generation players. This time it won't be a surprise. So the challenge is there and open and we know about it. So it's whether we can close down against France or, or not. Tim Cahill played at 10 minutes. What did you make of his performance and how will he be used in the World Cup? I think um, it's, it's put us in good stead that we don't really need Timmy. Um, you know, he, he only needs to play 10 minutes, which means we're doing well in the strikers sort of stakes. For me, the, the big point was that Tommy Juric had to come off for Timmy. He didn't and like he it, wasn't, did he? Mm -hmm. And he wasn't happy about it. With Mind you, going into a World Cup, you want to play as many minutes as you can. Um, Tim Cahill will be the go-to man if they need um, an aerial specialist to, to nod one in in the final dying seconds. But um, the reaction of Tommy Urich was was a, a, a little bit confronting for me, um, and, and you know McLaren I thought would have been nice to see him get some game time because he's really pushed uh, his efforts lately. So I really do think at, at the end of the day, us not needing Tim is a good thing. But seeing old timer come off the bench was a bit nostalgic for me. And uh, <laughs> you know, as, as a retired international, I, I, I hope all the best for him to come on and, and score the winner in the dying minutes because that's what he's there for. And we know a little bit more about Van Marwijk's um, set up behind the scenes now, Al. He's, he's paying apparently for his own coaching staff. That uh, makes sense to you? I, I rate that actually. It shows a real commitment from Bert Van Marwijk. It doesn't show that he has no faith in the Australian assistance that he's got at his disposal. It shows that he's got a very short window and he knows that there's existing chemistry with people he's worked with before. He's allegedly paying them yeah. out of his own back pocket. He's getting a million for, what, six months', six months work? Yeah. So he's probably got a, a little bit extra and probably banked a bit away in, in recent years, I would imagine, as well. And there is a family link there. I think there, uh, there one of them is his son-in-law, Mark Van Bommel. So he doesn't so need he knows to be how to keep, <laughs> He's keeping things happy at home as well. Yeah, well, there'll be no angst with, um, with uh, the Australian support staff, you think? No, no, not at all. I think that's the, the benefit of having such a great coach come in for the six-month tenure. These coaches know that he's going to be there for a limited time. They'd be like sponges, no, no doubt whatsoever. The, the boys in the, in the back room, they'll, they'll have that quarter, sort of, um, you know... You know, I don't know what to call it. You know, when people are just comfortable, yep. um, they just look so comfortable with each other so early that it, it's just going to it's going to be like sponge, like bring it all in. I want to learn as much as possible, so then they get better. And when you've got backroom staff that don't want your job. It makes things so much more tenable yeah. and everybody just gets along and you just want one thing and, and that's for Australia to win and, and it's really nice to see. Well, that's good. We'll need everything going well for the Socceroos. Let's take a look at the draw now and you can get your, your tips in. Uh, we're playing uh, against France, Denmark and Peru. I can tell you very quickly that Denmark played overnight and knocked off Mexico. 2-0. Mexico was a, a, one of the form teams uh, leading into the World Cup. Peru and Sweden had a nil-all draw and France equalised in the 78th minute against USA 1-1. Yeah, poor performance by France uh, for me, but I think if the Socceroos can really take it to France and get a, you know, they don't need to win. I don't, I don't really want to say that they need to win. It'd be nice to get a result, but they don't, just don't play poorly. Mm. Don't play poorly, don't get smashed. Leave your confidence for the second and third matches and I think we'll be right. I'm very confident in the boys. Yeah. Um, I really am. And at the risk of lapsing into cultural stereotypes, the French are notoriously jittery at the early parts of tournaments. Remember the game against Cameroon in their home World Cup all those years ago and so yeah. forth. So, you know, last time, as I alluded to that, uh, that Germany, you know, in 2012, you were going to get what you get from the Germans, but whereas the French can be a little bit flaky early on. So yeah. we'll see. Yeah, knock the wind out of their sails completely when you go back to that South African World Cup. There was such a sense of excitement going in that Australia might be able to do something coming up against the best. But to be beaten 4-0 in that game completely took the wind out of their sails for the rest of the campaign. You go back four years earlier, the win over Japan really lit a flame under the Australian team and they, they went on to the quarterfinals. So I think they're a chance to get out of the group for sure. For what it's worth, Jose Mourinho was asked during the week who's going to get through to the next stage out of all of them. He said, oh, well, France in that one and... Uh... Oh, maybe Australia. Yeah. I got yeah. the feeling he hadn't cut the form. <laughs> uh, now, let's talk about the...
appreciate uh, my good friend Jess Fishlock overnight being awarded a knight knighthood. Wow. So she's now known as Jess Fishlock MBE. So my Melbourne City um, fellow teammate and Welsh captain yeah. uh, has done amazing things for women's football and also the LGBTI community and, and she's been duly awarded uh, from the Queen. Great. Listen, you were at the State of Origin game. Tell us what it was like uh, to be in the MCG, which is sometimes a strange feeling uh, watching rugby league. Yeah, it is a strange feeling because it's also that rectangular sort of oval thing happening. Yeah. But, you know, they were pumping up the crowd. There were so many people there. And, and then as soon as that first whistle went, it was like dead quiet. And m part of me thinks it was because uh, every New South Wales or Queenslander in the room was actually explaining the rules to every Victorian, sort of saying, OK, so how many points was that and, <laughs> and what happened there and was that a strip tackle and mm. what's a knock-on? Can someone tell me? And then there were partisan people cheering for both teams. Uh, so that. you can't do that. I had a real problem with that. And then, <laughs> of course, there's that underlying issue of Victorians then having to cheer for New South Welshmen. Uh, so when they were very much in, in the lead or having the ball so much, the Victorian crowd was kind of like very subdued along with the Queenslanders and you could only hear the New South Welshmen, you know, rising to their feet. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting perspective because I was kind of torn. I wasn't sure whether the kind of subdued, different atmosphere was because it just was at the MCG with that neutral crowd or whether this is new origin. You know, we've got this young New South Wales team. We don't have the legends in the side. We don't have the biff anymore. You know, yeah. there was no big brawl to sort of spark up the crowd and say, is this new origin, which is just a really good game of football or was it just because it was at... Um, the MCG. I guess we'll find out over the next two years when it goes back into its natural habitat. It happens often at the MCG. The other thing is that uh, Aussie Rawls lovers that turn up to watch it try and spot the, the person that they would like to see in AFL. Uh, <laughs> and change Tom code. Yeah, <laughs> so like him. James Tedesco we just saw. Yeah, yeah we could see him off a halfback flank well, as well. Trebojevic's try when he contested for the ball on the, the right Wasn't wing. That, that was good. like an AFL high mark. Yeah. So. And apparently the Swans yeah. tried to, to snatch him as well as a youngster. I think we have history in AFL of those things not really mm. panning out. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's for example, Carmichael Hunt. <laughs> No, let's, uh, well, let's move on because it's a couple of weeks till game two, but uh, the AFL continues on and one big gap in the middle of the AFL doesn't have state of origin, but it, another issue that's, um, well, it's almost perennial now is the state of the game, Richard, and I know you're, uh, you're watching this very closely, but something jumped out at me yesterday in the newspaper, uh, Tim Warner from uh, Channel 7, saying that he's talking to the AFL about Whole, what would be wholesale changes, going to 16 a side uh, because, and, and bringing in zones and all the rest of it because of ratings. Mm. Uh, this would be worrying to me that a, that a man with yeah. commercial motivations would be lobbying the, uh, to make such big changes. Yeah, well, my first response to Tim Warner was, well, is your product the best it can be? Because the way the game is telecast does affect ratings, not just the game itself. And I think a lot of people looking at their Friday night package particularly might wonder whether it's actually as good a production as it could be. The next thing was Tim said he called the break after a goal the 30 most valuable seconds in sport and I thought if you want to get sports people offside and you're saying that the, the commercial is more valuable than the game itself and yeah. I know what he means in a commercial sense but it, it sort of bought into that thing that we're just creating this product just for TV. But having said that, the ratings are a, some sort of indicator of where the game's heading and it is going down. And I'm, I'm certainly of the view that the game doesn't look as good as it can be, it could, as, it, as it has been or as it could be. I just wonder, though, you know, all these committees they're forming, I'm, I'm of the view, hasten slowly. So there's things like maybe try the interchange first before we start having enormous goal squares. And there's just so many left-field ideas being thrown at once. They want to be careful they don't impose too many layers at once before yeah. they've tried out the most obvious solution. Maybe change the size of the goal, like yeah. make them big. <laughs> there you go. Maybe <laughs> not, <laughs> maybe not, like a typical football. <laughs> maybe not let the TV boffins make those changes yeah. before they look at it. Uh, uh,